Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, my name is Jordan Moy. I'm the Sustainability Education Officer at North Sydney Council. Um, and today we're running a webinar on getting a, getting off gas. Um, this is part of um, our educa education campaign um, for Electrify North Sydney, um, assisting residents and businesses to move to clean um, energy future, renewable energy, and all electric homes and businesses. Um, so welcome everyone, thanks for joining us uh, at Friday lunch chat. So um, I'd just like to mention as well that this webinar is, um, we're running this webinar because we're getting a lot of questions from residents, particularly around gas. Um, some, some of you attending today may have gas, so that's fine. What, what we're here is to, it's not to demonize anyone who, who's currently using gas. It is a, a technology that's very commonly used. Um, and so what we're, the aim today is to really provide some background about gas and then some practical steps to disconnect from gas when it suits you at the, at the right time. Um, just an example of how widely gas was used when we put in um, uh, started the, our sustainability centre um, at the coal loader in 2011, we had gas as a backup for heating. Um, since then, we've been able to disconnect gas from the entire site, um, but we also ran gas. Um, and it's, it's an example of um, how fast the technology has changed and how mainstream other technology has now become that has superseded sort of gas products. So um, I'd just like to present um, a couple of slides to sort of showcase why we're sort of running these uh, electric campaigns um, and electrify North Sydney. Um, firstly, it's been identified in our sustainability strategy um, that we're aiming to reduce greenhouse um, gas reduction from 65% from 1996 um, emission levels. We feel like that one of the best ways to do that um, is to assist residents and businesses to move to all the trick um, technology. Um, also, we've now um, beaten our benchmark um, and aim of having 100% renewable energy for council's needs. We do have that now. We've signed a contract with Zen Energy. So that's really pleasing. And so that's why we're sort of focusing on the 65% greenhouse reductions within the community. Um, these are a couple of slides from Rewiring Australia. Um, from left to right, you'll see that energy nationwide comprises about um, 78, 80%, close to 80% of greenhouse gas emissions in Australia. 60% of those um, of the, uh, are domestic. And then if you look at that final pie chart, we've got 42% um, are within the domestic sector um, of emissions. Um, so you can see that really the best way for residents it is what we do in our own homes and businesses has the most impact in terms of our emission reduction. Um, so here's what we'll be doing over the next few years. Um, I've mentioned this in previous webinars, but assisting residents to move to electric transport, electric scooters, bikes, cars, um, charging, solar, batteries, induction cooktops, um, and heating and hot water. So everything all electric there. Um, and here's a quick graph about, from Rewiring Australia again, about the impact, um, financial impact it can have moving um, to uh, all electric homes over a 10, 10 year period. So it uh, can be significant, particularly if you've got um, solar, um, and I think that gap will only get bit, um, bigger as um, the cost for running uh, purchasing coal via um, electricity um, gets higher over the following years. Also, we've just released um, three weeks ago our Council Sustainability Rebates Program. So this is a program that has 14 rebate items and services 
mainly focusing around energy, um, but also water um, as well, um, particularly weighted around apartments. As you know, we've got 89% of um, residents live in apartments in North Sydney. Um, so rebates work up to $5,000. Um, and so please check out, I'll be, I'll be sending a link about the program in the follow-up, but feel free to have a look. Um, yeah, lots of different rebates and most of the technology that we'll be talking about in the webinar today, um, you'll be able to have a rebate um, for that. So, okay, so let's get into it. Without um, further ado, I'd just like to uh, introduce Dr. Rachel Goldlost. Um, Rachel is a sustainability researcher at Renew and has worked as an environmental educator at Ceres Environmental Park with a focus on building design, eco-living, carbon footprint, recycling and energy programs. Um, Rachel is also an academic with an interest in renewable technology, housing and energy policy. Rachel writes regularly for Renew Sanctuary and has written for Organic Gardener, Pip Magazine and The Owner Builder. She regularly appears on ABC radio and presents on panels on a range of topics related to off-grid living, all electric homes and natural building. Welcome, Rachel. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jordan. So this is an abbreviated version of our Getting Off Gas Toolkit website that we have put into a uh, half an hour presentation. And we are going to cover a number of issues that intersect with the broader theme about household electrification and the problems and issues with gas. So this is going to run for half an hour. Um, and hopefully it will give you a full overview of some of the issues and then some of the solutions for how you and your household can get off gas. So we're going to cover some of the background, some of the problems. We're going to look quickly at um, some of the mythologies around the green alternatives, including why we should be getting off gas and do a little bit of myth busting in terms of the pros and cons of gas versus electric. And we'll look briefly into how to start your journey, but we're doing this just as an overview. There is a full complement of chapters and resources available at the Getting Off Gas Toolkit, which will be a bit more fleshed out than what I'm going to cover today. Um, and I thought I'd just throw in some of the lessons from our recent webinar series, which looked at five different aspects of the Getting Off Gas Toolkit in more detail with um, a slew of professionals and experts across a number of topics. And I'm going to talk about that at the end. So background of gas in Australia. So gas stoves first came to Australia quite some time ago in the late 19th century um, and have long been a stable part of the Australian domestic landscape. So the flames could be altered to suit the different operations of roasting, baking, grilling, toasting, frying and heating. And they also had a complete monopoly for some time as wood stoves were starting to be phased out, particularly in the cities, and electric stoves didn't really enter the market until the 1940s. So... Um, gas infrastructure became available to many more Australian homes and consequently gas stoves which were cheaper to purchase, cheaper to run and required no installation fee sold in much greater numbers than electric stoves. So gas has been a big part of how we power our homes since the 1950s following trends in the USA where natural gas or methane and liquid petroleum gas or LPG were promoted as safe and natural alternatives to wood, coal, coke and oil. So in the early days, gas was used for cooking, heating, hot water systems and refrigeration. So what are the problems? So there was once a really good case for gas when alternatives were wood and oil and electricity was generated by burning coal, gas was definitely considered to be the cleaner fuel. And since Australia has vast reserves of gas, which is seen to be ideally suited as a transition fuel between coal and renewables, it can deliver some greenhouse gas emission reductions over coal burning. But in fact, the gas that is piped through cities to homes and businesses is still problematic. 
There are trace gases that are released, mostly methane, methane and butane and propane, um, and it is carried through high-pressure gas pipelines, which, ex which also require extensive clearing and digging in order to um, roll it out across the country. Pipelines are particularly damaging where soils are highly erodible and acidic and where they cross rivers and creeks and where they impact on important farmland and wildlife corridors. So as well as the direct impacts of clearing vegetation or farmland or disruptions to landholders, some of the key risks for gas pipelines include potential fires or explosions by ignition of national gas, erosion of soils and pollution of waterways, the spread of weeds and diseases through extensive vehicle movement, property devaluation due to concerns about the risks associated with living near pipelines, the greenhouse gas emissions from the venting and leaking from the pipelines and health risks associated with living near the gas pipelines. So gas is also problematic in terms of how it is being extracted. So about 19% of Australia's greenhouse gas emissions does come from natural gas. Although 70% of our total gas reserves are conventional gas resources and 30% from coal seam gas resources, coal seam does account for about 80% of the Queensland domestic supply and is growing in other states since, the, uh, since they have removed some of the moratoriums on fracking. So what is fracking? So fracking is when gas is extracted from what is called unconventional reservoirs located on coal seams and shale layers, which is often located between valuable agricultural land. Coal seam gas extraction usually involves tens of thousands of gas wells with roads, pipelines, compressor stations, wastewater dams, and other sizable infrastructures. Coal seam gas projects can spread across hundreds and thousands of hectares of land. There have been numerous risks and problems as identified with coal seam gas gas fields. These include encroachment on farming land, disruption of other industries, clearing of bushland, air pollution, contamination or depletion of ground surface water, pollution of waterways, health impacts on um, civilians and workers and nearby residents and damage to biodiversity. Recent studies have found unexpected high levels of methane in the air near coal seam gas wells. It is concluded that we do not yet know enough about the impact of coal seam gas mining. So this brings us to the other alternative that has been floated through the media and through a lot of discussions across Australia, which is the potential for green hydrogen. So green hydrogen is currently being pursued quite heavily by gas companies and the federal government who have highlighted a possible low emissions replacement for gas um, made, made by green hydrogen, made from methane, from organic waste or hydrogen made using renewable electricity. These are alternatively referred to as green hydrogen and biomethane. There are possible uses and benefits for these methods in hard to abate sectors, for example, in emissions industrial processes such as steel production, shipping and chemical refineries. However, if you bring it down to the household level, they are significantly costly and less immediately deployable than direct electrification. So hydrogen is also seen as an indirect greenhouse gas because although it itself does not cause a warming effect, it interacts with airborne molecules called hydroxyl radicals to produce to prolong the lifetime of that atmospheric methane which is the highly potent greenhouse gas, and increase the production of ozone, which is another greenhouse gas. So the production, processing, and distribution of hydrogen through the existing gas networks also produces significant energy losses as it must be compressed throughout the process. So this brings us to the why and why we should be getting off gas. So... It is estimated that about 200,000 new homes are being built in Australia every year. And since our energy system is rapidly transitioning to renewables in some states, it is up to somewhere in South Australia is up to 75 to 80% of the, of the state electricity is being provided by renewables. Um, it makes more sense for us to be able to transition our households to electricity in order to maximize the um, use of that renewable energy and not rely and rely less on coal and gas for daily electricity. 
the use of gas for heating, hot water and cooking and for households and the non-industrial commercial sector does remain high and cannot easily be decarbonised. So this is a graph that has been produced by Renew in 2022 that looked at the emissions over the winter months. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, for an area of um, southeast Melbourne, and it compared, we did um, modelling based upon um, six different types of um, households. It was all modelled on a standard 200 metre square detached um, household. Um, and it was graded from being uh, the blue line, which is the least insulative and least effective household, which is no insulation and using all gas systems, right through to the um, grey and the green lines, which look at um, insulation and no insulation, but using electric sources of energy for heating and cooling, which is reverse cycle air conditioning. So it's looking at the emissions reduction over time from 2014 to 2035. And if you compare particularly the orange line, the blue line, the yellow line, which had very little emissions reductions over time for um, any of the households that use gas compared to the two that were electric only. So we know that electrification of homes is viable and cost effective. So our analysis has consistently shown that energy efficient all electric homes are already more cost effective than standard dual fuel homes and that converting an existing dual fuel home to all electric is always going to have an economic benefit for households. Since gas is increasingly expensive, on average, wholesale gas prices increased by 234% over the last decade compared to 137% for electricity. Gas has risen by an average of 6.3% per year compared to 3.77 for electricity. So this graph here is looking at a, an average home in C eastern Sydney between 2022 and 2024. Um, and looking at the difference between those houses, particularly at the top again, which would be a basic gas house, which would be uninsulated, looking at the cost for 2022 being somewhere around 2,000, on average, 2,416 per year, and looking at the increase to 2024 to 3,648 per year, and that is for um, gas supply, heating, cooking, um, and hot water. Um, and then comparing that to a seven star all electric house with solar, which in 2022 cost somewhere around 700 per year, which will increase to somewhere around 1,282 per year. So an increase of 500 compared to an increase of over double that, which would be 1,200. So by 2024, a household in Sydney will save more than 240 a year by switching from gas to all electric, and the savings will increase over time. So getting back to the why, we know that gas is far from clean. We know it is a polluting fossil fuel that is already harming our health and the climate. Emissions from natural gas occur from the CO2 that is released during combustion, but also in the home. So since there are nearly 11 million homes, 70% of them currently use gas. Gas appliances such as unflued heaters, especially if they are old or poorly maintained, release methane, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide into the home. It pollutes indoor air and it endangers our health. Homes with gas stoves contain 50 to 400% higher concentrations of NO2, nitrogen dioxide, than those with electric stoves. So gas stoves can make our indoor air up to five times dirtier than outdoor air, which, which affects cardio, those with respiratory and cardiovascular illnesses, bronchitis and asthma, and is particularly susceptible for children and the elderly. It is said that children living in homes with gas stoves are 42% more likely to have asthma. In Australia, cooking with gas is responsible for up to 12% of the burden of childhood asthma, even though only 37% of Australians have gas in their homes. Taking action while cooking, such as using a range hood, opening windows, or using an air purifier can help improve indoor air quality and reduce exposure to air pollution while cooking. Fun facts. Electric appliances powered by renewables are actually cheaper to run than gas. 
The efficiency of solar, wind and battery technology has continued to improve while the cost of producing panels, turbines and batteries has decreased. Although gas is about half the cost of electricity per unit of energy, modern heat pumps use as little as a quarter of the amount of energy to heat air or water as their gas equivalents. It is now cheaper and more efficient to use electricity than gas for heating hot water and cooking, but it does also depend on your choice of appliances. Renew believes it is always better to replace your last gas appliance when it is particularly when it is due for replacement with an efficient electric one in all circumstances and all locations. Your choice of appliance and how you use it can cut your energy use and bills. Home appliances will account for somewhere around 50% of all energy used in the home. Recent data suggests that end-of-life appliance replacements are not the only economical electrification scenario for households. For example, prematurely electrifying space heating has a payback period of around seven years or around four after the current government rebates. Adding hot water to this leads to a payback period of approximately 10 years, six after rebates, and adding cooking while also abolishing the gas connection leads to a payback period of about nine years, six after the rebates. So premature appliance replacement will take longer to pay back than an end-of-life replacement. However, they still present a net present value positive abatement opportunity, which could be further encouraged via incentive schemes and zero interest loans. There definitely isn't anything natural about natural gas. So we've been calling it natural gas since the early 1800s when it was called natural to distinguish it from the dominant gas fuel at the time, which was coal gas. And gas is a natural product, much like petroleum, wood, rare metals, or any other um, ecological artifact. It consists mainly of methane, but what is not natural is the speed in which we have dug it up and burnt it. In, in, which produces carbon dioxide, methane, and other gases. We prefer, in the industry, we prefer the term fossil gas or methane gas to better convey to the public the potential threat of our continued use of gas. Sunlight and wind are both natural sources of energy that don't need to be dug out of the ground and are available for us to harness without the environmental and climate harm used by mining and burning gas. There is no political will to stop the production of gas. So the Australian Petroleum Production and Exploration Association argues that the state and local governments are taking the choice away from households and disconnecting households from gas will drive up emissions because some states, particularly Victoria, still rely heavily on brown coal fire power generation. The peak body has even launched an advertising campaign pointing the finger at coal and spruiking gas as a key part of the nation's drive to cut emissions. Energy efficient electrical appliances reduce the overall energy consumption and consequently will reduce the emissions compared to less efficient gas appliances. It's increasingly becoming clear to politicians and state bureaucracies that electrifying house, household fossil gas is one of the lowest cost decarbonisation options now available to government. While the gas industry promotes gas as a transition fuel because they want to keep selling more gas, but since over 70% of our gas is exported, it actually has little impact on Australia's greenhouse gas emissions because emissions are only counted in the country in which they are combusted. The gas industry is indeed buying time for as long as it can. If it was truly committed to decarbonisation, it would move towards encouraging electrification. So Victoria has set up um, targets and is continuing to move forward to increase our decarbonisation at a very fast rate. Our reduction targets are among the most ambitious with 75 to 80% reductions on 2005 levels by 2035. On top of the policy in Victoria, which has banned all new gas connections for dwellings, apartment buildings and residential subdivisions requiring planning, they have also released a gas substitution roadmap, giving industries and utilities a vision for where the state is heading. State policies in New South Wales, such as the New South Wales Electricity Infrastructure Roadmap, will seek to deliver benefits to regional communities, but there hasn't yet to be a coherent energy policy strategy that can direct industry and the utilities. 
There is the potential that fossil gas volumes could reduce to a point where the lowest cost solution for the energy system is to transition the remaining users off the gas network. Transitioning to all electric homes and businesses is the fastest way to make them net zero, rather than hanging on to gas appliances and gas infrastructure. We have a growing share of clean, renewable energy, and there's enough effective electric appliances now that we can switch today. So now I'm going to move into questions about the how. So we advise everyone to give the process of moving from an all gas household to an all electric household, particularly a lot of time and to make a detailed plan. We encourage people to get advice and to do your research. So first we start with encouraging people to understand their household energy use because it's going to be particularly difficult to size different appliances and different options for your household if you don't already have an understanding about how your household, your flat, your share house uses energy and then how you can start to make reductions from a number of different angles. You can get a scorecard assessment. You can talk to a home energy auditor. You can get an energy kit from your local council but generally it means um, looking at where you use the most energy and looking to trade out that appliance first. It makes sense to replace the appliance that uses the most gas as this is going to make you give you the most savings quickly. And then you can also look to figuring out a timeline for um, replacing the rest of your appliances. If you're assessing your household needs, here are some questions that could get you started. How big are the rooms that you need to heat? How many people are using the hot water and at peak times? How many pots do you need and how many people are you cooking for? How much space do you have in and around your house for both indoor and outdoor components? What is your budget and what other criteria are important for you and your family. Generally, the better quality, more efficient products that you buy, the greater value for money over the long term. Cheaper options might seem attractive when considering upfront purchase costs, but if they're less efficient, they will cost more to run. So it is important to look at the life cycle of your appliances. Next, it's important to check out the rebates. State and territories across Australia are continuing to roll out programs that are helping households not only install solar power, but make energy saving upgrades. These rebates and assistance grants are intended to prove overall energy efficiency and environmental outcomes for households. Whether or not you qualify will depend on your location, income and assets. There are assistance schemes for both households and for small businesses across many states. Rebates and payments help consumers cover the cost of purchasing and installing new equipment. They can come in the form of a discount on the price of the goods or service or a partial refund after you've paid. You can check out the energy.gov.au and energy.newsouthwales.gov.au websites to find out what's available now. You can also look to North Sydney, which has sustainability rebates that are currently funding hot water, heat pumps, solar and batteries at northsydney.newsouthwales.gov.au. Please keep in mind that rebates and their offerings and the eligibility can change. So this is a slightly more complicated graph, but it is basically a cost assessment report that has analysed the variation in upfront costs for home buyers when looking to build or purchase a new all-electric home compared to a new dual fuel electricity and gas home, and this these, these numbers are for Victoria. So in this modelling, a variety of scenarios were created for de new detached houses, townhouses, apartments, equipped with different electric and gas appliance types to highlight where the cost disparities occur. These scenarios represent commonly constructed new homes in Victoria, and I could not locate a similar modelling exercise for New South Wales. So the findings of the report demonstrate that introducing a moratorium on reticulated gas connections for new homes would not lead to an increase in upfront costs to home buyers, regardless of some of the mythologies that are being spread. So if you look at 
particularly um, scenario one, which is the gas, which is the gas ducted detached house with a dual fuel mix. The total cost scenario is somewhere close to 20,000. So it's 19,660 and that does not include the EV. So I'm looking at the total cost scenario before the addition of an EV. And then if you run across the line and you look particularly at um, uh, all electric homes, similarly in um, scenario number three, which has a heat pump and induction and ducted reverse cycle, you're looking at 20,670. So and not a market increase. If you go across to apartments for the same kind of comparison, you can look at Number scenario number seven, which looks at, uh, it does have a reverse cycle for heating and cooling, but with instant gas, um, water heating and gas for cooking, you're looking at 13,040. And for an apartment that is all electric with reverse cycle, um, electric instantaneous and induction, you're looking at a cheaper new cost at 12,830. Now these numbers were, um, pulled together in 2022 and they could vary but the graph does explain that the decision and many developers are already cluing onto this because in installing gas um, infrastructure to new developments is a costly expense and if they can afford not to and if they can provide how if they can provide residents with um, housing that is roughly at the same cost cost point as those that were previously dual fuel, a lot of the large developers are already looking to build with all electric. So for renters, the situation for renters is far more dire um, and there are a lot less options when it comes down to really being able to affect the major appliance installation, but there are other things that renters can do. Um, and we are by no means the only um, people talking about options for renters and there's increasingly conversations that are emerging around mandatory minimum requirements for tenancy, particularly in Victoria and New South Wales as well. So it's clear though that energy efficiency in private rentals is much lower than that of owner occupiers. Since landlords are the primary decision makers for improving their rental properties, it is critical to understand their energy efficiency behavior in order to um, look to promoting the uptake of energy efficiency retrofits across the private rental sector. So regulations are set by each state and it's important to check your local regulations. For advice on your rights, a good place to start is with the tenants union or tenants advocacy groups who will have up-to-date information. As a renter, generally, you can request repairs when required. If a gas appliance is broken and needs replacement, you can then request consideration of an efficient or electric alternative and do some of the legwork in order to provide the quotes for that to happen. And generally, you may see better outcomes if there is um, a solution that has been provided alongside the request. While many property managers or owners are likely to simply replace like for like appliances, choosing all electric appliances is not going to significantly increase the upfront cost and avoid future costs of replacement. Renters can also take reasonable steps to improve the thermal efficiency of their home by themselves. Low barrier steps that typically don't require formal approval include sealing gaps and drafts, temporary window film to reduce heat transfer, and installing some kind of external shading, including plants, to reduce the summer heat. What are the options for apartments and strata? So we know that as the population increases, cities are continuing to densify and housing policies are increasingly looking to increase the proportion of multi-unit developments with 15% of Australians currently living in strata titled properties such as apartments and townhouses. But we also know that strata units and apartments have unique requirements for going all electric with, come with specific limitations and barriers. It is 
best to work with your committee and or work strata working group to come up with a plan, a timeline and a budget and include the residents or the steering committee of the residents in the decisions. Amendments for shared use areas or the whole complex may be easier to undertake than if you were looking to, to perform an individual unit retrofit and you may be able to um, get better value reductions on appliances if you do a bulk buy purchase. In the short term, apartment residents or commercial tenants can reduce their gas usage by using portable electric appliances where practical. And you can also consider you purchasing renewable energy via green power to reduce the whole unit or the building's emissions impact. A split heat pump system provides more options for installing a heat pump in the strata building as the evaporator and fan, which do look similar to an air conditioner, can be mounted on an outside wall of the apartment building and the hot water storage tanks can be installed in an enclosed plant room. The body corporate is responsible for such energy use in shared spaces. The body corporate is also responsible for centralised hot water systems and decisions for replacing centralised gas hot water systems. It may be possible for residents to electrify individually, but there are definitely more benefits for taking a whole of building approach, particularly bulk buying appliances and systematically coordinating the installations. You can also look, particularly in Sydney and North Sydney, at programs such as what Wattblock and Illum are offering for examples of electrifying strata. So back to drawing up a timeline and your timeline is going to be influenced in, in all ways by your budget. If you have money saved or you have access to a low interest loan or you're eligible for rebates or subsidies, it is worth getting started straight away because the savings will only increase over time. The large savings that you will receive in the first few years from switching out your first appliance, which is probably going to be the heating from gas to electric, will help you fund the second appliance probably water heating and so on. This is one example of a simple plan in terms of replacing the gas heater, which uses the most, then looking to replace the hot water, then finally replacing the cooktop, which for many households ends up being the last switch out. Um, using a tool such as make the switch calculator can explore the relative cost savings and payback periods, but please note it is based in the ACT. So what always comes up is the question about disconnection fees. Um, and this is definitely still a moving feast across um, federally and across the states. So navigating the different differing requirements and costs of disconnecting from gas at home can be is definitely varied across the states and can be incredibly circumstantial. So what you can do is to elect to either abolish or disconnect gas from your property, and the costs will differ for each across each provider and state. Tighter regulations of the fee schedules for utilities that they are allowed to pass on to consumers is currently under review. In New South Wales, the abolishment fee is listed as somewhere between 11.39 and 13.81, and in Victoria, it is currently uh, $220 after they have um, standardized the um, utility, the ability of utilities to charge. So the difference between abolishment and disconnection is that abolishment involves removing the pipes that connect the premises to the main pipeline. This also involves sealing the main pipeline and making the whole site safe. It involves a significant amount of more work than the disconnection, the, the disconnection process because of digging up the connection point to cut the service line from the mains, um, evacuating the gas and removing the meter safely. There's This means that there's no longer an active pressurised gas line service to your property, which is the safest option. Disconnection means the connections is just severed and capped and you will still have an active pressurised gas line. It is usually expected to be temporary and the gas can be reconnected at any time, hence the lighter fee. So what are the lessons learned? Um, from our recent webinar series where we looked at five different aspects of the getting off gas story, 
Um, these are the some of the main points that stood out for me that I thought to extract, which is um, the importance of making a plan and having um, an overall budget that will be amended, but having a way to look at staging the project so that it doesn't become too daunting um, and disconcerting, and that allows people to tackle different parts of a much bigger project, which will lead to reductions in your energy bills and a safer household eventually, but it may not be clear until you have all of the information at hand and until you can compare, particularly when it comes to certain appliances, what you can spend and what you would like to spend. So from the industry, it is preferred that you look at efficient electric appliances over all electric appliances and not all electric appliances have the same um, potential benefits for households. Uh, older appliances are definitely not going to be as efficient as newer appliances. Um, we discussed retrofitting, um, particularly when it comes to looking at more problematic houses across the country, and it is definitely something that should be tackled in stages, whether or not you take it from the envelope in or whether you look at the appliances first we suggest that you pick uh, certain portions of the project to start as opposed to looking at an entire retrofit, which will be costly if done at one time. Uh, make sure you check the energy ratings for all appliances and make sure you think about the whole of life of that appliance, which will, particularly for heat pumps, make a considerable amount of difference if the heat if the heat pump is scheduled to last between 10 to 12 years or as some of the cheaper ones are coming on the market may only last for five years it is worth looking at the, that differential you can definitely work to optimize your solar system that can maximize the efficiency of your appliances depending on um when you use them and how much those appliances can be automated in order to maximize use of um, direct solar as opposed to looking to having to install a battery to use the energy in the evening. Um, and from our um, fourth session, which looked at troubleshooting and tradies, it became clear that if possible, seek out a wraparound tradie service to un undertake major appliance works. Um, these tradespeople can not only give you a complete package, which means that they can look at your home and the particulars of your home and look at which appliances would fit best in the space that you have, but they can also make sure that there's no gap between the services and they will also make sure that, that they do the contracting of the tradespeople so that you don't have to do the organisation of when one tradesperson comes and when another comes and they can make it a smoother transition. Um, I just thought I'd leave you with some resources and this is the toolkit. If you haven't already checked it out, I would highly recommend going and having a look at the toolkit, which covers a lot of the topics that we've just talked about, but the um, how to get off gas has... Um, many chapters that cover a range of topics, including how to understand your household energy use, look, signing up for green power, um, what's the difference between different appliances and how to choose appliances for your home. And that includes um, detailed sections on induction, on different forms of heating and on different forms of hot water. Um, it also has a much more detailed page on electrifying strata and um, tips for renters. So if you want to check out the webinar series, we have them available on our Renew YouTube. This was the series we did um, planning how to effectively plan for a whole of house electrification journey, um, how to choose your appliances and the pros and cons of different appliances. If you're an appliance nerd, that would definitely be the um, webinar that I would look to. Um, how do solar and batteries connect with all electric homes, um, trades, wiring and troubleshooting, and then finally electrifying renters and apartments. I also thought I'd put together just a few resources that I draw on quite heavily for the work that I do, um, particularly the report and the modelling undertaken by Renew, which has um, very um, detailed breakdowns across the country for different types of houses and the kind of savings that you can make by moving to a seven-star all-electric home. Um, 
You can look to the Make the Switch campaign in the ACT, which has excellent resources on their website, um, particularly in New South Wales, the Rewiring Australia website and resources and the Electrify 2515 project, which is being undertaken to electrify all of that postcode, is definitely a project that's worth looking to. Um, I would also suggest if you live in Strata to check out WhatBlock and check out what they're doing in terms of um, large scale Strata electrification programs, which are the most ambitious uh, across Australia. Thank you for your time. And I really hope that you get something out of this webinar and the all electric homes webinar that have been put on for um, North Sydney Council. Thanks so much, Rachel. Um, spot on information there. And um, I think you addressed most of the questions because there weren't a flood getting sent through, which is a good sign, I think. Um, and I have actually heard about the wraparound yeah. tradie services before, so that's really good to know. Um, I think very useful. And I know it is a barrier for residents in North Sydney um, strata, so I think that's a really good um, sort of service that we might, might follow up um, on later as well. Um, you did mention what block and North Sydney residents are eligible for to um, join the Future Proof Program, uh, apartment program, so that is free, no obligation, um, whole building assessment from what block. Um, and they will, um, yeah, they'll be, provide that and then support you um, through a full plan with, um, yeah, tailored initiatives, um, what to look at first um, and then work your way down and they'll support you on the journey there. So I'll, I'll send, include those details, but we have currently over 150 buildings um, as part of the program um, and many more joining um, pretty much every week now. Um, and um, we're getting really good results in terms of um, solar, batteries, EV charging. Also, yeah, the, the getting off gas toolkit from you is just fantastic. So um, as Rachel mentioned, we'll um, send that through um, and um, that is just a fantastic resources for digging a bit deeper to what we've sort of covered today. But there's a few more, a few questions coming through now. Um, so we might start with those. The first one is if gas is disconnected, can the gas company charge the backlog of rental for the gas line when, if it is reconnected? I, I feel like that's a very piece of string question that is going to depend on the utility provider and the way that they um, are doing their business. I mean, we had heard when we started digging into the disconnection and abolishment fees in Victoria that there were mm. vastly different experiences of customers having different fees being charged across the line, which is why they're looking to regulate and systematise the disconnection. And the Australian Energy Regulator has looked to do so across the board, but not it hasn't necessarily filtered down into all of the states. So Victoria has, has put a cap. Mm on the yeah. discussion in terms of backlog i reckon you'd have a pretty good case to not pay it and they're not going to do it but that would just be my <laughs> that yeah. would be my my version of that I, I haven't heard of any buildings going back to to, to gas after they've um, disconnected um so that would be surprising in itself i think is it have you heard of any cases of buildings doing that Rachel? no yeah no but there's, there's not a lot out there, to be honest. It's a very new kind of um, conversation that's been happened where people are actually, um, I didn't put a plug in for my fish and electric home, which we always um, shout out to whenever we run programs because it's a Facebook group that with, I don't know, bloody tens of thousands of people in it by now. And there is a answer for every single question that you might have around electric going electric. And I'm sure there's plenty of um, disconnection and abolishment stories if you just put them into the search function into Facebook. It's not as easy to see and search as the website, but you can also just pop questions in there and there'll be a flood of answers. So that's a, also a great resource. Yeah, all the all the links that, that Rachel um, has mentioned today in a presentation, I'll, I'm happy to include in the follow up email. Um, 
A couple of questions about disconnection. Can we just sort of, it is a relatively sort of new thing for people to sort of get their heads around. Is it, can you sort of explain um, if they are looking, is there, is like disconnection versus abolishment, What? how do they make the decision? How is that sort of, what's that process that they need to sort of consider or well, some of the things they need to consider? I mean, it definitely depends on the site. It is going to depend on the um, access, mm -hmm. gas access, because, you know, the gas companies do have a pretty strong case to argue that the labour involved, and they're trying to socialise this across the network, but they do have a strong case that if they have to send out two tradies for an entire day, that that cost is going to be quite significant in order to, this is for abolishment. So this is to actually dig up the pipes to make it safe. Um, and the more that that happens, because if we think about the grid as being a grid and the more that that happens, I feel like the more expensive it's going to get because there'll be gaps in the, there'll be gaps in the gas system. So, you know, the, the utilities will make a case for disconnection and capping um, but I think there's still an annual fee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure if you can continue to avoid the annual fee. Yeah, I think it's probably safe to say more homes and apartment buildings are disconnecting from gas than. Mm. Um, and it, it's going to um, it's going to yeah, be getting the abolish abolish, mm. abolish from gas in total. So at the moment, and um, yeah, so um, what else have we got? So, yeah, that's an interesting question. Do you have to disconnect a whole building from gas or can one owner do it? I, I would I would find that, like, conceptually difficult if we're talking about strata. I think that would you can probably, um, but you'll still pay a fee. Guaranteed you'll still pay a fee. I think, like that Rachel mentioned. Yeah, a fee required. Yeah. I think like Rachel mentioned in her presentation, um, for individual lot owners in apartment buildings, um, you can certainly electrify your lot by having an induction cooktop. Um, some instances, hot water, um, heat pump, not all though for apartments. Um, and also you can have portable cooktops as well. Um, there are different avenues for people in lots, um, but yeah. I think that's probably right that your advice, Rachel, about disconnecting. Um, yes, all links can be found, or most of them at least, on Renew's Getting Off Gas Toolkit. Is that right, um, Rachel? Yes, they can be. We're still we're still yeah. updating it. We're still updating the page, but yes, most of uh, the links to a lot of the, especially the national resources like the scorecard assessments or. Um, the rebates or anything that people are looking for will be on the Getting Off Gas Toolkit. Maybe one final question, then we'll wrap it up. Um, what are the options for continuous flow instant hot water that aren't gas? I'm yeah. Heat pumps are pretty instant. <laughs> <clears throat> we have a sand and heat pump. So, so what was that? I think you just lagged a bit. Can you? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Heat pumps are pretty instantaneous. So a heat pump is as instantaneous as an instant gas hot water um, and they work by drawing energy out of the air and I live in a secondary dwelling so we have a shared heat pump and I get instantaneous hot water even though I'm not right next to the actual heat pump itself. Yeah. I think that's fair to say, yeah. Um, heat pumps, same with me. And I think that's the yeah, the best technology at the moment that we can recommend and the, the most efficient as well. So, yeah. All right, I think that's all the questions. Thank you so much, Rachel, for your time um, today. Really appreciate your advice um, and presentation. And as we mentioned, we'll be sure to share all the links um, that she, Rachel's talked about today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, look out for some further webinars um, next year. Check out our rebates page and um, feel free to get in touch if there, if there is anything else I can do to, um, as a council support you or your building to disconnect from gas and move to an all-electric homes or buildings. Thanks, everyone, and have a great night day. <laughs>
Sziasztok!